Let us read Exodus 4, verses 1 through 17, returning to Mount Sinai and the burning bush. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto me. The Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thy hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the second sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Amen. Exodus 4, verses 10 through 12, is this morning's text. Exodus 4, 10 through 12 reads, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. 
By this time in this sermon series, beloved, I take it that you have it fixed in your mind that Exodus 3 and 4 includes Moses' five questions or objections regarding his call to office. And we can now be more specific. The first two of those five are questions. Number one, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Chapter 3, verse 11. And number two, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? The first two are questions. The second two are objections. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses says again, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And then the first part of our text. O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And you should notice that through these four, things are getting worse this is the way it often goes with our children we tell them to do something something that we think is very simple and easy to do and at the first we get questions do you really want me to do this is this a good idea and then you get objections and then you get a flat out refusal and that's what's coming next by the way next week lord willing and we often do the same thing ourselves when we know what we ought to do Questions, and then objections, and then a flat out no. That's the progression, or rather, the regression. We should notice too the issues that Moses brings up in these questions. First of all, Moses refers to himself. Who am I? That is, I'm not up to this. And then the second question concerns God who art thou so who am I and who art thou in the objections Moses first of all appeals to Israel they they won't believe Lord that thou hast appeared to me or sent me and then Moses refers back to himself there's only a problem with them but there's a problem with me I am not eloquent you may have noticed that when I looked at those four issues addressed in these first four responses of Moses, that the first and the fourth are about Moses himself. Generally, he says in the very first one, who am I? I, as a person, don't measure up. I can't do it. And then the last one, this morning's focus, is more specific. I'm not eloquent and what Moses is saying is that generally I'm not up to it first response and specifically my weakest area is my speech and that's an interesting question for us what would you say is your weakest area in your Christian life in your office as a believer or as an office bearer. And this passage is teaching that our weaknesses, and nobody's denying the weaknesses, our weaknesses, we mustn't let them become an excuse in order to avoid doing our clear duty because that's what Moses is doing here. Let's consider this word under the theme, and these are actually the words found in the midst of verse 10. I am not eloquent. I 
am not eloquent. We have here Moses' objection, that's verse 10. Jehovah's questions, rhetorical questions, forceful questions, verse 11. And Jehovah's promise in verse 12, to reassure Moses and tell him, now you must go and do what you're told. I'm not eloquent. Moses' objection, Jehovah's questions, and Jehovah's promise. We need to understand first what exactly Moses is claiming in Exodus 4 verse 10. He's referring to words. And there are two main ways in which words are used. There is the written word. Then you think of your hand. Well, I'm right-handed, so I do it like that. And then there is the spoken word, which involves, of course, the mouth. Now, it is true that Moses' inspired writings do not reach the heights, let's say, of Isaiah's soaring prophecies or of David's moving psalms. But then part of that's explained by the fact that Moses is usually writing about law or history and ordinarily at least, law and history aren't going to be as exciting and deeply personal as Isaiah's prophecies and David's psalms. But for all that, Moses is by anyone's reckoning an extremely capable writer. He wrote about the creation by direct revelation. He gives us the fascinating family narratives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He describes powerfully the goings on in the wilderness wanderings. And he even wrote a couple of songs. The song of Moses in Exodus 15 after they crossed the Red Sea, and Psalm 90. So he was versatile and skillful in writing. And in fact, in the wisdom of God, Moses penned the first five books in the Bible. He was the man God chose for that high task. And if you think about it, you'll have to agree with this, Moses penned, more chapters of inspired scripture than anyone else. And there are some 187 chapters in the Pentateuch, and then add Psalm 90. And that is actually a lot more than Jeremiah 57, or John, the fourth gospel, the last book of the Bible, his three epistles, or even David, who wrote the majority of the Psalms, or Paul, who wrote half the books of the New Testament, but they're shorter books. <coughs> Moses wrote more Bible than anybody else. Moses' objection as to why he shouldn't go on this mission concerns his spoken words, not his written words. Exodus 4, verse 10. O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And then in the next six verses, the word mouth is found six times. So use the mouth for speaking, whereas use the hand for writing. So what is Moses saying here as regards the problem with his speech? He's not saying, I have a lisp. People with lisps struggle to pronounce the word S or Z. Moses isn't saying, I can't go to talk to Pharaoh, but sure, I've got a, a stutter or a stammer and I'll be laughed out of court. He doesn't have a stutter. And he doesn't have what's called a clutter. And the clutter is when someone speaks too fast and the words sort of roll over one another 
and then you say, pardon me, what was that you said? I can't make it out. I just got a jumble of sounds. Moses doesn't lisp, doesn't stutter, doesn't plutter. In fact, Moses was not here in our text or anyone else, anywhere else claiming to have any sort of speech disorder or speech impediment whatsoever. Moses is not saying, but Lord, don't send me. I need to go to the speech therapist. That's not what he's saying. Instead, Moses claims to be deficient in eloquence or oratorical skills. That's the way our authorized version has translated his opening salvo in verse 10 of chapter 4. Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. And then he goes on to explain, I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And literally, I am heavy of speech and of a heavy tongue. And here we need to be careful. He's not saying, I have like a swollen tongue and that I can't move it terribly well so that I mumble. When he says that he's not eloquent, that he's slow of speech and a slow tongue, he's saying my speech isn't nimble. It's not skillful. It's not captivating. I struggle at times to find just the right word. Who doesn't, especially if you're getting older. It's not powerful. My speech isn't moving. And a lot of us here today, probably everybody would say, I can identify with Moses. I feel a lot of sympathy with that guy because I'm not eloquent either. And you say, well, why did he bring this up? Well, ask yourself, what office is it to which God is calling him? A prophet. And what is the number one public work of a prophet? Speaking. To whom is this? Is Moses sent here? Israel. So he's going to speak, not to a mere family, I'm not disparaging families, I'm just talking about numbers here, or to a congregation or a denomination. He is going to speak to a nation of millions of people. And at the very start, chapter 4, verse 1, and the very end, chapter 4, verse 9, of the third question or objection, we have reference to Moses' voice. Behold, they will not believe me nor hearken to my voice. Chapter 4, verse 1. Why? Well, in part, because Moses is following that train of thought, they're not going to listen to my voice because I'm not eloquent. And if someone is going to address a nation of millions of people, he needs to be above average. He needs to be capable, and I'm not up to it. So the office of prophet doesn't fit. The audience, this vast nation of Israel... I'm going to struggle. And then you're telling me, Lord, that I have to go to Pharaoh and the whole royal court. And they're capable, sophisticated, knowledgeable people. And there we can say, doubtless, as with any royal court, oratory or persuasive speech is essential. You can't come into the palace of perhaps the mightiest ruler in the world and use flat, dull speech, he'll just chase you out and not listen to you. I'm not up to it, especially because I'm not eloquent. The office of prophet, addressing a few million Israelites, addressing the mighty Pharaoh, don't choose me. And you'll understand, beloved, that we need to ask this question. Is it true that Moses wasn't eloquent? He's making a, a claim here. Is he actually right? And here we should observe that Moses not only 
makes this claim in chapter 4 verse 10 I'm not eloquent, I'm of slow speech, I am of slow tongue. But he makes it later in the book. In Exodus 6, he refers to it twice. This is what he says to the Lord in verse 12. Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Uncircumcised lips. Chapter 6, verse 30. Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. That phrase again. And how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? The Bible refers in different places to uncircumcised ears. And somebody with uncircumcised ears doesn't hear well. Spiritually. The Bible talks about an uncircumcised heart. And someone with an uncircumcised heart doesn't reason, think, believe well, to put it mildly. And here it talks about uncircumcised lips. Moses is saying again that I don't speak well. Not a speech impediment, he doesn't lisp, but I'm not eloquent. So Moses repeatedly claims that he isn't a great orator. Some of you may recall at this point words quoted earlier in this series from Acts 7 verse 22. Stephen's speech minutes before they stoned him to death. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Moses was mighty in words. But then there's some clarification. It mighty in words, maybe in written composition, because you can use words by writing or speaking. Maybe in written composition, Moses was an A plus, but in public speaking, he was an A or an A minus or something like that. And then if you aggregate the thing, it would still turn out that he was mighty in words, but he was slightly better at writing than speaking. Think about that one. Then there's Moses' statement in our text that he had never been eloquent. Chapter 4, verse 10 says, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, that is, up to this point, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant when Christ in the burning bush addressed him. So up until that point and during this conversation. This brings up the issue of the quality of someone's speech over time. Moses has spent the last 40 years as a shepherd in Midian. And one would expect that whatever you learned in your first 40 years in the top universities in Egypt, so to speak, including written and spoken language, you're going to lose a certain amount when you're out there in the desert with nothing but sheep to talk to. So you get rusty. You spend most of your time alone and you don't get to speak to other human beings. But Acts 7 verse 22 says mighty in words in the context here because Stephen's tracing Moses' life in the three bands of 40 years. The context here, he was mighty in words in Egypt is especially what it's saying in Acts 7. But Moses says not, well, Lord, I've gotten rusty because I've been looking after sheep and goats for four decades. What do you expect? Moses said, I've never been eloquent even when he was in Egypt. And yet Acts 7 verse 22 says that he was mighty in words. And even if you distinguish written words and spoken words, it's getting a little bit harder to maintain that Moses is being completely honest. On the other hand, though, we have to say in Moses' defense 
that the Lord actually admits that there is something in his objection. In chapter 4, verse 14, we're dipping into next week's text, Lord willing, but it's appropriate now. The Lord says, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And the Lord is saying, You have a brother, an older brother, he's three years older than you, Moses. He speaks better than you. So the Lord is saying, I, I grant you some of that. And then we have chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. God says, Thou, Moses, shall speak unto Aaron and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with Aaron's mouth, and will teach you what you shall do, and Aaron shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he, Aaron, shall be to thee, Moses, instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God, and that you convey words to him, and he passes them on. So the Lord is saying, Aaron's a better speaker than you, and I'm going to give you Aaron, so that you, through him, can present my message more eloquently. So there is something to what Moses is saying. It comes down to this, that Moses here is exaggerating his lack of eloquence in speech. And we're all familiar with exaggeration. And human beings exaggerate, especially at certain times. You're telling a joke. And if you make the joke just about prosaic people and prosaic things, it isn't funny, so you sort of exaggerate it. And most people expect you to exaggerate the scene. I'm going to tell you the most amazing thing that happened to me yesterday. And on and on it goes, and it's just a little bit hyped up. We also exaggerate, and this is a worse scenario, in boasting. You should have seen what I was able to do when I was 14. I almost jumped out of the long jump pit and we're beyond the sand and I hurt my knee. And that's exaggerating to the point of lying. Well, we also exaggerate when making excuses. That is, we play up our weaknesses in order to get out of doing what we don't want to do. Don't we, children? We do that. And grown-ups do it too. You want me to do this, but I'm no good at that. I wouldn't be able to do that. Phew. I thought I was going to have to do some work. I thought I was going to have to do something that I really didn't fancy. Glad I got out of it. We do this in the home and at school. Well, I'm no good at writing. I'm no good at maths. I, I'm, I'm no good at memorizing. Which means I'm not even going to try. And of course then you're never going to be any good at all these things. But you just give up all the time. In fact if you start keep that giving up at everything. You'll be no good at anything at all. Because you'll just get into the habit. Of pulling out and giving up. I'm no good. So I can't do this in the home. I can't do this in the school. I can't do this at work. I can't do this at church. And the real explanation that underlies so much of that is. Really. I'm just lazy. I'm just lazy. And laziness is a really bad trait in human beings because human beings are made to work. And that's the positive part included also in the fourth commandment. And if we're lazy and we're not doing our work, we're not doing one of the principal things that God has called us to do. Work. And you'll recognize here too that in our text and in our own behavior, we need to distinguish when we're talking about our weaknesses and limitations, we need to distinguish between humility and exaggerations. Because we do have limitations. And sometimes our limitations are such that you can say with all honesty, I know what I can do and what I can't. I know what my workload is. I know where my skills lie. And I genuinely think that this is too much for me. I decline. So I know my weaknesses. 
and I'm being honest about it, I'm not up to it, I'm not the man for it. I actually know somebody else who would do a better job than I go and talk to so-and-so. And then there's humility in saying, I don't think by any means that I'm overqualified for that task, but I think that with God's help, though I have certain weaknesses, I will be able to do it, so I know that I lack skills here, but it's not debilitating. I'm going to pray that the Lord will help me, and I'm going to do it. So there's humility. But there's all, which is a good thing. But there's also exaggerating our weakness. And you know you're exaggerating your weakness when the weakness has been turned into an excuse because you don't want to be bothered. And that's what Moses is doing here. Now, admittedly, Moses is being asked to do it astronomical work to go and talk to Pharaoh who could kill you to lead two million people and they weren't the greatest two million people either so there's humility I have my weaknesses and there's also exaggerating the weaknesses and sometimes sometimes it might be hard for us to know the difference but it's certain that the Lord knows the difference and he knows our hearts and we've got to examine ourselves. Now it's striking too that speech issues play a significant role in the calls of the three longest major prophets in the Bible. I'm referring of course to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah's call, chapter 6, the Lord appears high and lifted up. The seraphims cry, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah laments, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Isaiah doesn't say, I'm not eloquent. I could never go and preach. He was remarkably eloquent. But his complaint is, I use the skills that I have in speaking sinfully. My unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then in the next two verses, the seraphims come with a hot tool hot coal to cleanse Isaiah's lips. So they're sinful speech. And he needs to be sanctified to bring God's word. Jeremiah, in chapter 1, verse 6, mentions speaking too. Jeremiah 1, verse 6, the young prophet says, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. For I am a child. I cannot speak. But here his objection isn't as such on his poor or limited speaking abilities. That isn't really the point. It's actually on his youth. I cannot speak. For I am a child. He's saying, I cannot be a prophet. Which involves speaking. Because I'm too young. So the word speak is in there. But speak in the, is the, carries the idea of just delivering thy word, O Lord. I'm too young, so therefore I shouldn't be asked to be a prophet. And when we turn to Ezekiel, with that amazing vision granted him, Christ, the one of the appearance of a man on the throne, high and exalted, says to Ezekiel, Thou son of man, be not afraid of them, the Israelites in the Babylonian captivity. Neither be afraid of thy word, of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. And here Ezekiel is told, 
your ministry is going to consist in a battle of words. Their words you must not be afraid of, even though these are words spoken by people who are the equivalent of briars and thorns who will try to rip you to shreds. And they are people like the scorpions who will sting you. And if the scorpion doesn't manage to kill you, he'll certainly drive you through an awful lot of pain. Don't be afraid of their words, what they say. But continue to speak my words. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, prophets. It's about words in different shapes and forms, words. But here's Moses, who is Israel's greatest prophet and Israel's foundational prophet. And his difficulty is slightly different. He doesn't think that his speaking abilities are good enough. And so Jehovah, in effect, tells Moses that he has overlooked and forgotten something, or rather someone, that makes his analysis hopelessly skewed. What you say, okay, I get it, it's exaggerated, but you're missing the, the key thing, Moses. Don't you get it? So the Lord reminds Moses that he is the sovereign creator. Ah, that changes things. He's the sovereign creator of man, of man's body, and of all the parts of man's body. And therefore, Jehovah is in control of all of our bodily functions. And that means also in control of all of our bodily limitations and disabilities. And without saying that we're a bunch of crocs here, everybody says, that's good to know. That's good to know. And the first two things mentioned by the Lord in Exodus 4, verse 11, in this response of Jehovah, deal specifically with Moses' objection. Moses, you're talking to me about, about your mouth and your eloquence and what you can't say and how you can't say very well, slow of speech and slow of tongue. But Moses, who made man's mouth? Who made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb? Because I've made a lot of people whose speech is an awful lot worse than you. I've made people and they can't talk at all. And while we're at it, who is the one who's made other people deaf? And with respect to the eyes, some human beings can see with their eyes and other human beings are completely blind. And you understand that God could go along. And who has made the lame? Who, is, who has made those who only have one arm? And on and on it goes. And Moses at this stage is, oh yeah, didn't think of that. You could put it like this. The Lord is saying to Moses, your basic problem is you are thinking too much about yourself. All I hear from you, Moses, in verse 10, and indeed these other objections, but we're focusing now on verse 10. All I hear you, Moses, is about yourself. And this is, of course, the fundamental problem with human beings. There isn't a single person in this room who doesn't think too much about themselves. And there isn't a single person in this room who doesn't think too highly of themselves either. Because that's being sinful and depraved. And the world talks about self-esteem problems. And actually the self-esteem problems is you're not actually thinking wrongly about yourself and the right problems either. You're not thinking enough. You're, not, you're thinking too much about yourself. And the correlate. You're not thinking nearly enough about me. And if the Lord from heaven were to speak to us directly, I have no doubt that he'd say, your problem is you think too much about yourself, all of us, and your problem is that you do not think enough about me. In fact, you go for minutes and hours, and you never think about me at all. And if you did, if you did, you'd be a far better Christian and a far happier and more fruitful person 
But you think that you need to keep thinking about yourself, and there are things, of course, you do need to think about yourself, but think about God. That's what Moses is being told. And if Moses is being told he needs to think about the Lord more, where does that leave the rest of us? Because we're criticizing Moses here, but there isn't any of us who would have done any better than Moses. You could put it like this. The Lord interrogating Moses. Now Moses, think it through. Do you think that I have gone to all this trouble to appear to you at Mount Sinai in the burning bush as the angel of the Lord in order to bring my people out of Egypt only for you to come up with an objection with which you stump me? I'm not a good enough speaker. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. I didn't think of that. This whole meeting has been a giant mistake. Yeah, Moses, you're, you're not up to the job at all. I don't know what I was thinking of. Just keep looking after your sheep. I'm sorry for troubling you. I'll turn off the burning bush and just disappear or something. Really? And you see how silly it is to come up with objections against the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't just create the mouth and some people eloquent and other people dumb. But he determines absolutely everything in time and space and history as the outworking of his eternal decree. I am that I am. The absolute, unchangeable, omnipotent God. You never win an argument with him. And what the Lord is saying to Moses is, I know better than you all about your speech skills and what grades you got in Egypt decades ago. Look, I'm the one who invented the human mouth. I have created billions of tongues and lips and teeth. I've made some people as eloquent as Demosthenes and other people, and this must be an awful thing, have never been able to utter so much as a word. And now Moses, just, just take that on board. You need to factor that into all your considerations. <coughs> And this word is given to help us today, all Christians, so that we don't cry off when he tells us whatever our calling is to open our mouths and witness for him. Let's say there's a young man and he's considering the call to be a minister. And obviously public speaking is necessary for a minister. He's got to preach, lead Bible studies and so on. And maybe he's not the most eloquent person in the world. I mean, who is? There only can be one person at any one time who is the most eloquent person in the world anyway. And you do need some skills. But you're going to have four years of seminary training. Four years of seminary training. You'll do some practice preaching and there'll be men there who've been preachers for years and they will help you. And then you will have a six-month internship. And in the 21st century, and indeed the last century, we have PA systems. So even if your volume is a bit low, we plug something in so you don't have to shout all the time. So that's not an issue today. It was a problem in previous generations though and if we turn to the ruling elder 1st Timothy 3 verse 2 says apt to teach and the ruling elder is apt to teach as regards his office as a ruling elder so that's going to involve some speaking but you advise and admonish the saints you speak on family visitation or sick visitation you exercise discipline even to the point of excommunication or even the readmission of someone is excommunicated but for a ruling elder the speaking that needs to be done isn't always or even usually public it's usually if not always private or in small groups. And if the minister doesn't have to be eloquent, 
you can't say, well, I'm not qualified to be an elder because I'm not eloquent. Well, it's not even really part of the job description, so to speak. Personally, and I would expect, not because I'm saying this, but I think this is just generally the case, I think that you would say the similar, similarly, I think what the people of God want in an elder is godly sincerity and that they would rate that more highly than eloquence or oratory or rhetoric. Give me an elder any day who is sincere and godly, an older, faithful man who opens the scriptures, who says sensible, biblical things and that carries weight with people. Oratory isn't necessary. I mean, if the guy's eloquent, yeah, a bit of a bonus, but not required at all. For the work of a deacon, our form for the ordination of elders and deacons mentions that the deacons should bring comfortable words from Scripture when they distribute the alms. So there's a speaking role for deacons but you're bringing it to an individual or a couple or a family and you're explaining to them the mercy of God and Jesus Christ, the sinners through the cross, the forgiveness of sins and you say that Jesus Christ has appointed me as a deacon in the church to express the mercies of God to you in material aid behind which stands the yearning gracious heart of our Saviour. So you may you explain that, maybe sometimes you read the scriptures and so forth. But you don't have to be eloquent. Godly sincerity is all that's needed. And now imagine a situation whereby a minister is going to speak to a hostile audience or an elder gets in his car to drive to visit someone on a dis difficult discipline case or any one of us witnessing of the grace of God and Jesus Christ to family and friends and you're facing the problem which crops up every time to one degree or another what am I going to say? I find myself getting tongue tied stumbling over things I'm not the greatest speaker in the world in Exodus 4 verse 11 this word to Moses God says to us you're thinking too much about yourself here again there's a place for that but Remember, you're not the only one here. You're my servant. Who hath made man's mouth? Who made your mouth? And who makes some people dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind or eloquent or not eloquent or fairly eloquent or very little eloquent or whatever? Haven't I the Lord? Believe that and go in that confidence. And what I'm doing is I'm just saying that you can't allow an excuse to stop you doing what you're supposed to do. You have to overcome excuses, expose excuses, and then just obey in every sphere of life and especially in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And then after Jehovah's questions, we come finally and more briefly to Jehovah's promise. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Think back to the introduction. Notice the similarity of this word to that spoken earlier. The first question or objection, who am I? And the Lord's answer, certainly I will be with thee. So who am I? I'll be with you. And here we come to the fourth question or objection. I'm not eloquent. More specific. The problem isn't just me, it's my speaking ability. And how does the Lord respond to that? Not I will be with thee, but I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So don't Refuse my call because of your weakness. Generally, I'm not up to it. Or specifically, I'm not a good enough speaker. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you what to say. And I'm going to help you how to say it. 
you will notice too that the Lord did not say, when Moses pointed out, I'm not eloquent, the Lord did not say, I'm going to make you eloquent. I am right here and right now, just as I gave you three miraculous signs in the previous nine verses, I'm going to give you supernatural rhetorical skills, Moses. He didn't say that to the great prophet of the Old Testament. And he doesn't say that either. He just says, I will be with thy mouth. I'm going to help you bring my word. And this is what the Lord says to us in the office of elder or minister or deacon. Or to all of us in the office of believer, male or female. I will be with thy mouth. Believe that and speak. And besides all of that, the power in the speech of the Christian is not actually in his eloquence anyway. The power, because that's a misconception, the power lies in God's truth itself. And insofar as man's capacity comes in, you could say God's truth itself as spoken with conviction. And Paul himself, because he was criticized unfairly, exaggeratedly, for his lack of oratorical skills, Paul points out, 1 Corinthians 2, When I came to you in Corinth, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, because I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I deliberately didn't use rhetoric, because I want you to believe the simple truths of the Bible, so that your faith doesn't rest in my eloquence, but in God's word. And how can we discuss speaking the word of God without reference to the personal word of God himself? Here is part of the conversation involving the two on the Emmaus road. They said about him who had been crucified just a few days before that he was Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. Mighty indeed and word. Far greater than the Moses who was mighty in words and deeds. Acts 7 verse 22 again. What did the people say in response to his ministry? Where does this man get these words? Never man spake as this man. And Isaiah puts this very well. In fact, here is Christ himself speaking in chapter 49. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver he hath hid me. My mouth is like a sharp sword. What I speak, sharp sword, the sharp two-edged sword. And he says he's like an arrow taken from the quiver of God and fitted that goes right into the hearts of God's people to work repentance and faith. And a few pages over, this same person is described in Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not, but surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
And that's the cross where God and Jesus Christ brings healing and forgiveness for all our sins, including sinful speech and sinful fears that we weren't eloquent enough and when we didn't speak when we should have. And so the Lord, in closing, reiterates his call. Now, therefore, go. Go. I'm going to with your mouth and I'm going to teach you what thou shalt say. Go. And Moses still doesn't want to go. But that's next week. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would give us a far greater wisdom than we possess in our speech and courage, that we may speak the truth, and that thou be pleased to use thy word despite all our sins and folly. For Jesus' sake, amen.